Lord, we are so grateful for the gift of your word, for the fact that you speak, and that when you speak, we live. Pour out your spirit on us today, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the focus of our message today is on this text that Judy just read for us. It is, if you look at it in, in your printed Bible or if you're following along in, in an app on, uh, on your phone, you'll see it's laid out like poetry because it is one of the earliest hymns of the church. Unfortunately, it wasn't given to us along with, um, along with its tune. That would be really neat to know. But it's wonderful to see that here in this letter to the Philippian church, which was... Uh, written well before the end of the first century, Christian hymns were already being sung and shared among the churches. Paul quotes this hymn, and it's our focus, but we need to zoom out a little bit to the larger context, and we'll do it again at the end of our, of our time together here in, around this text. Um, why is it that Paul is quoting this hymn? What is his purpose in that regard? He begins the letter with his joy and gratitude with the emotional and spiritual bond he has with the people of Philippi. He talks about that bond in two particular ways. He says we have, we, we've had sharing in the gospel and sharing in the grace of God. He uses the same uh, Greek word in verses five and seven. It's not always translated into the same word in English, but at the beginning of Philippians one, he does this. It's a word for sharing, for partnership, for fellowship. We have the fellowship of the gospel. We have the fellowship of the grace of God. He goes on and he offers encouragement in suffering for the disciples at Philippi. And he starts with his own story. He's got Paul's in jail again. Paul seemed to have a habit of this. He preaches Jesus. He gets thrown in jail. It happened in Philippi. It happened where he is. And, and they know about it. They've actually sent one of their members to help take care of Paul in prison because in those days you didn't get cared for in prison unless somebody on the outside was doing so. So... Not only is he dealing with the indignities and the pain of being in prison, he's also dealing with some emotional harm. Because there are other preachers that are Paul's rivals, just so you know, in every field of human endeavor, we get competitive, sometimes in ways that are not holy. All right. And some of these preachers, some of these preachers are preaching Jesus not because they want Bonnie to meet Jesus. They're preaching Jesus because they want to cause more trouble for Paul who's in jail. That's just bad. It's also just you. And so Paul processes this with the Philippians and gives them some encouragement and he places his trust in Jesus. For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. Either way, I'm God's. Whatever happens. And he gives him this encouragement out of his own life because he acknowledges that they're experiencing suffering as well. We read it together. He, God has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Joe, it's a privilege to suffer for Jesus. Aren't you so glad you have that privilege? Now notice, it's not just suffering in general. It is suffering for Jesus that he refers to as a privilege. That, that's a different thing. But he goes on and he describes that suffering for them. He says, you are having the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Well, what struggle did he have while he was with him? He was put in prison for preaching Jesus. What struggle is he having now? Well, he's back in prison again. So you wonder if some of them are in prison and you wonder about one of the first guys who comes to Jesus while Paul's in Philippi, that jailer who had actually put Paul in prison. Is he supposed to put some of his own church members in prison? Or did he quit the job? What's going on with that? We don't know. That's an interesting aspect of the story. Paul also acknowledges that there's some conflict going on in the church because disciples of Jesus... Don't always get along. Newsflash. Hmm. 
chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. By the way, it's the same words that he uses in chapter 2 when he says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Now, if Paul is calling out Yodia and Syntyche in a letter that's read to the entire congregation, you know there must have been some issues, though he doesn't go into them. So, here's the fact. The church in Philippi is under pressure. They're experiencing suffering. And under pressure, even the most healthy and stable and joyful systems manifest stress. Amen? And stress fractures. Are you familiar with that? Have you ever been surprised at your bad behavior when you're under pressure? Oh, I knew it was the wrong thing to say as soon as I said it. But it just slipped out. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been surprised at the bad behavior of a friend or colleague or loved one when they're under pressure? <gasps> I can't believe you said that. We've all been there. And so Paul calls the disciples of Jesus at Philippi to oneness. And we read the beginning of that call at the beginning of the worship service. It's not a oneness of agreement on every matter. It is not a oneness of uniformity in every way. It's not a oneness of unanimity in, in our way of thinking. It is a oneness, a unity that's rooted in how he began the letter, the shared experience of the gospel and the grace of God. That sharing, that fellowship we have together. He says in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 2, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, is there any, just a smidgen? If there is any consolation from love, if there is any sharing in the Spirit, there's that word sharing again, if there is any compassion and sympathy, if you've got just the smallest amount, then he appeals to them to be one. It's a oneness, it's a unity that is manifested in humility. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit. It's the very same humility of Jesus when he talks about having the same mind and the same love. Same as what? It's the same as Jesus. Now, we've all had the opportunity to be offended, to be put off, or maybe even to be slightly amused by the self-importance of someone else. Aren't I just great? You know what JP stands for, right? Come on, come on, give it to me. It's just perfect. There we go, there we go. We've all had the chance to be amused or offended by that. Someone too important to wait in line with regular folks. Someone who expects to be treated like a star. Someone who expects and insists on hearing how exceptional they are. They butt in line, they demand attention, they interrupt incessantly, they feel no need to excuse themselves or to apologize. And we have all had the chance to meet important people who don't seem at all affected by their star status. Wow. We show up, not a lot of confidence, and we walk away saying, boy, they're really down to earth. They're just like me. But how would a God show up? How would a God show up? It's an interesting question. Human imagination has told lots of stories of gods on earth, most of them with pyrotechnics and special effects of other kinds. And Jesus certainly did his share of miracles. But Jesus' miracle working, as strange as it might seem to us, was not the most outstanding feature of his life and ministry. You see, in Jesus' time, there were other faith healers. Those other faith healers, they focused their work on the rich and on people who could pay, kind of like a lot of faith healers today. Jesus instead focused his work on the poor. There were other folks in the ancient world that were talked about as sons of God. Now, not in, in the Jewish setting, but in the broader Greco-Roman world, there were people called sons of God. But where were they? They sat on thrones and ruled kingdoms. Or they led huge armies into battle. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. 
What set Jesus apart as healer and miracle worker was his embrace of poverty and weakness. And it is exactly what's described in today's reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians in this remarkable hymn of the early church in this letter written by the apostle from a jail somewhere in the Mediterranean basin to a church he founded from a jail cell. The apostle of weakness. He writes this about Jesus. Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited or grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, we all know what it feels like to be nothing, to be zero, or what an old pastor of mine used to say, to be the zero with a circle rubbed out. We know what that feels like. And in situations like that, we want somebody to stand up for us. We want someone to recognize us as somebody, as a human being, please, just like the rest of us. But Jesus, not long before being in human form, Jesus, in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but made himself nothing. The, the Greek word literally is emptied himself, something we're about to do with that picture. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant or slave, found in appearance as a man. Now, there's this great British tale about a king who decided he needed to get more in touch with the common folk, so he put himself in disguise. And he hired himself out as a day laborer and spent the day working in the field, and when he came in to the house of the farmer at night, he had one more job to do. The farmer's wife wanted him to watch the bread in the oven so it wouldn't burn. But he'd worked so hard that day, and the oven was so warm, and he was just so tired. <sighs> and the bread burnt to a crisp. And the farmer's wife told the king in very clear words exactly how he had failed. Hmm? And then it's Hello, I'm the first, world's first undercover boss. I just happen to be the king, everybody. Oh, your royal highness. But he didn't get on the farmer's wife for how she spoke to him. In fact, he did the things that undercover bosses do, give out awards for hardworking good people, right? And stories like that make us feel good about those who lead or, you know, have those important places that they haven't forgotten everything about what regular life is like. But they don't even begin to touch the extraordinary humility of Jesus who emptied himself. You see, the king, he gets the pleasure of giving out gifts after his undercover boss experience. And everybody thinks he's just marvelous. And he goes back to his throne and his castle. Jesus... He doesn't do the big reveal. He goes to the cross. The prophet Isaiah talks about Jesus emptying. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. You know, today we talk so much about fulfillment and about, what well, we have it in the Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of... Hmm... It's not in the Bible, just so you know. We don't want to hear much about emptiness. We'd rather have the fulfillment path. Empty wallets, empty gas tanks, empty pockets, empty cupboards. It's the everyday experience of countless Americans, including millions of children, some in our own community. And it's the experience chosen by Jesus. See, before he can be taken advantage of, 
which he was, before he could be ground into the dirt, which he was, before he can even be killed, Jesus made the decision to be given away, to be emptied, to be devoted so that he could fill you and me, and he owns that choice. In some Jewish theology, when, they talk, when the rabbis would talk about how God has created the world and the universe and all that is, they would talk about God being all and the only way for God to create something other than God is for God to empty God's self and to make space for something else. In Christian Trinitarian theology, when we talk about this holy mystery of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God forever existing in three persons, some of the technical language that we use for that is the interpenetration of the members of the Trinity. That is, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make space in themselves or empty themselves for one another. But this theme is explicitly introduced in the scripture in this hymn of the ancient church where Jesus empties himself to make space for us. What an incredible gift. So we began by zooming back and paying attention to the context of this letter and how it impacts why Paul is choosing to use this hymn. We said the context is one in which the church is under pressure and they're dealing with conflict and he's calling them to oneness. Paul is asking us to embrace emptiness ourselves, to have the same mind, the same love that was in Christ Jesus. Instead of focusing on our status and our reputation and our R-E-S-P-E-C-T, put others first. Put their interest ahead of me. Instead of obsessing on how different and frustrating someone else can be, even sometimes our own offspring units, Make space for them by emptying yourself. Instead of ruminating on an offense, forgive with compassion and sympathy. That's the practical dimension of embracing the emptiness that Jesus embraced in our own community, in our own discipleship together. Lord, we thank you that Jesus did indeed empty himself to make space for us. And we pray that you will help us to empty ourselves to make space for others. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn is Amazing Grace, number 378. We're going to sing verse 1, 2.